Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are happy to have all of you guys in the chat box with us today who are watching us live and who are watching us here um, on a recording. My name is John Shoemaker from the Department of Educational Technology, and I am here today to share with you uh, a great panel of two former vice presidents from Walt Disney World. Uh, I know many of you in the chat uh, have been talking about Disney World already and talking about your experiences and sad that you weren't able to make it there, uh, had plans to go there, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, but today we're going to be taking some questions and answers with these guys. They're going to share their knowledge with you so that you can learn um, a little bit about what it takes to run such a large company with that many people and uh, also get figure out what skills you would need if this was a career that you were interested in. So with that, I'm going to introduce my colleague, who is Dr. Eric Jorgensen. He is also in ed tech. He's going to be our question asker today. So Eric, if you want to take it over and uh, introduce our panel, I will let you take everything over. So take it away, Eric. Thank you, John. I am Dr. Eric Jorgensen. Um, I am also a former cast member from Disney, so I decided to wear my, my name tag and my old costume shirt. I was at Epcot Interventions. I also did VIP tours at uh, Epcot Guest Relations. I met uh, one of our panelists when I was there at Epcot. He did a training on time management, and we'll talk about that a little in a little bit. So I'd like to introduce Lee Cockrell and Dan Cockrell. How are you doing today, guys? Right there. Very good. Thanks, Eric. Not a problem. So l l real, real quick, um, let's start with Lee. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you, what you did at Disney? Yeah, well, I uh, worked for Disney for 16 years. I was recruited in 1990 to go to France and open Disneyland Paris in the food and beverage area. Uh, I worked there for three years and I came back to Orlando. I was in charge of the hotel division for about two years and then in charge of all the... Uh, guest operations for another almost 10 years, and then I retired, and uh, it was great. Loved it. Awesome. And Dan? Yeah, so my first Disney experience was on the Walt Disney World College program. I was a sophomore at Boston University and came down and worked there for a summer as a front uh, desk host at the uh, Contemporary Hotel. And then two years after I graduated from uh, college, I came back to Disney and my first job was parking cars at Epcot. And then I went over to France uh, for five years. I opened uh, Disneyland Paris and worked as a frontline manager there for five years. And then uh, moved back to uh, Florida in 1997 and worked another 22 years at, at Walt Disney World. Uh, Epcot, uh, worked in the hotels for about six years and learned about how to run hotels. And then went back to parks for the last uh, nine years of my career there. So both of you were familiar as guests of, of Disney prior to becoming cast members with Disney. What are some of your favorite memories about being a guest? <laughs> well, mine was I was a guest only at Disneyland back in 1973 when we lived in California. I had never been to Disney World until I went to work for them. I didn't tell them that during the interview. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. But, uh, so when I joined Disney, that was my first experience. That's the first time I was ever in a Disney park. Wow. Yeah. And I have a similar story. I, my first visit to a Disney park was Disneyland in 1973. I was four years old. And um, the second time, well, actually, my first visit to Walt Disney World, I was uh, 19 years old when I got the Contemporary. So I'd never been there either. Um, I'd seen it on TV. I had watched all the Disney movies. Um, but yeah, we that wasn't part of our vacation. A lot of times we would go and travel and, and go. My grandmother lived in Oklahoma. That was like the best place to ever travel. But uh, we didn't have any, like you said, we didn't grow up uh, with uh, doing Disney. So Dan, you talked about the college program and I know what that is, but why don't you tell our, tell our guests what the college program is? Sure. Yeah. When you think about hiring uh, for a big company like Disney, you really think about all the different uh, places that you can go to find people to work there. Um, we have full-time employees who work uh, in the parks and resorts who live here. We have part-time people. Uh, we have uh, people maybe who are retired that live up north, and they come down in the, uh, the winter to Florida 
for the weather and they may work part time. And we have a group called the college program. So we go to uh, colleges all over the United States and we look for people who mostly a lot of times are hospitality majors, but not always. And we uh, give them an opportunity to come work in Florida for three, uh, six or nine months. And uh, college students will come down here. We have a housing complex. So we have apartments that uh, shared apartments that we put students in. We have uh, buses. You don't have to have your own car while you're here. Uh, we have professors. So if you're studying hospitality, you can actually get college credit by going to classes while you're working here. And uh, so we, we, we talk about it as a living, learning and earning experience. You learn at work, you learn in class and you learn living with other people from um, all of the United States and all over the world. And we have about 12,000 college students here at any given time when we're open. And uh, it's a great way for students to get a, a great experience to get Disney on their resume. And it's a great way for Disney to see all the talent that's coming out and graduating from uh, colleges. Now, question to both of you. You know, you talk about the experience you get working at Disney. Um, what do you think, what do you think makes Disney that gold standard? Um, I know even to this day, and it's been a while since I've worked at Disney, but I still put Disney on my, my resume because <laughs> it, it does give such a wow factor. But what about Disney gives it that wow factor and how can that be brought into, you know, the, the school environment? Well, in my opinion, I talk about Disney does three things better than anybody else. They hire better, they train better, and they treat the people better. And uh, of course the attractions and the shows are great, but uh, there's really no player in the world you can go and be, have the uh, service and the attention uh, that you do from the Disney cast members. It's just a special, uh, special environment. Fantasy is real, we say at Disney, <clears throat> and people really appreciate that. And uh, you know, when you think about it, if you've got great people and you've trained them, and you treat them well, they'll probably take good care of the guests. And uh, that's uh, what happens at Walt Disney World. And of course, it's got that reputation forever because it's been around for so long, and people are proud to say they worked at Disney. <clears throat> you know, Disney's not selling cigarettes. We're <clears throat> we're selling uh, happiness <laughs> and fun. And so we're already ahead of the game just because we have such a great product. Yeah. yeah and I'll tag on to that. I think if I was going to take the example of a school, um, you know, we, at Disney, we, we understand how important it is that the leadership sets the tone for the environment. They create the culture. And so let's say you have a school and you have a principal and the principal can walk around talking to all the kids, which is important. But the principal's main job is to create a great environment for the teachers to teach in, uh, value them, make sure they get all the tools they need and the training they need and that they're rewarded and they're, they have clear expectations. And if the teachers feel valued, they're going to much more likely do a much better job in the classroom to pass that on to their students. So it starts with the principal, the leadership. Uh, then it goes to the teachers. The teachers feel great about what they're doing. As Lee said, if you hire the right teachers, you treat them right, you get them trained right, they're going to be great at what they do, and the students are going to benefit from that. So that's kind of the, I would say, a parallel equivalent of a, a theme park. That, that's great. So then how do you get leadership on board with, with fostering that positive culture? How do you get them on board? Yeah, I think by the time they come on board, you better hire people that are already on board in their brains because to take somebody that you're going to hire for a leadership position and have to start training them to understand uh, how to treat people, respect for people, uh, those kind of things is pretty hard. So you just got to make sure you bring the right people in, especially in the leadership position. At Disney, we're very careful who we not only hire and bring in from the outside, we're extremely careful about who we promote inside because... Uh, there's a lot of great managers and you need both. You can need a good manager who can keep the business under control. You need a good leader who's going to make sure uh, everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're focused on the right projects and uh, uh, the, the simpler things, you know, it's kind of like parents. Uh, great parents produce great kids. <laughs> so, and uh, it, it, you'd really got to look for that great leader out there in the world that uh, I, guess, I think is focused on, understanding it's all about the kids. It's all about the kids, not, not the union, not the, it's about the kids. 
Yeah, so, I mean, if you look at it, you know, Disney focus on the guests, it, it, and they try and do everything from the perspective of what is going to please the guests. So it would be what would be best for the student. You know, just just looking at it from that perspective, what what's going to make the best productive students for when they, you know, move on to the world, whether it's they go to college or they go into the workforce immediately. But what is going to really make them the best productive members of society? Yeah, that's right, Eric. I, you know, you said something at the beginning for the students out there who are trying to decide what their career path is going to be. Um, first of all, you'll never know what your career path is going to be because the world today moves so fast and all, things change so quickly. So the advice I've given a lot of uh, students is don't worry about the job you want. Just think about the kinds of things you like to do. Um, and if you can find the kinds of things you like to do and find a company or a job that you get to do those things, you are going to be much more likely to be successful. You're going to have a lot more fun. So for example, you know, as I grew up, I liked service. I liked doing things for people. I liked making people feel good. And so for me, it seemed like it was a logical move to get into the hospitality industry because that's what you do in the hospitality industry. So when you can take your natural skills and your natural talents figure out what they are and then go find a job that you can do that. Um, like I said, everything's easier and you feel like you fit in. Um, you know, Disney's not for everyone and insurance companies are not for everyone and finance companies are not for everyone. Um, so it's, it's not, not anyone can do anything. You have to be, know what you're good at and what you like doing. And you have to find the company that values those things and you'll put yourself in a much better situation. Um, I'll use an example. Um, if you are really strong, it doesn't mean you can run the hundred yard dash quickly. So you should be out there doing things that are going to use your strength in sports. And if you're really fast, but you're not, you know, really strong, you should be in events where you're getting a sprint every day. So if you think about it like that, find things that you like to do. And, uh, and then you'll, like I said, it's, it'll be much more easy and a lot more fun to have success and happiness in your career. That's great. Let's start taking some of the questions from the live chat. We have one from Roth Cantor. Um, what I want to know is how you predict large group gatherings will adapt, uh, when we can get back to being economically steady without risking further exposure, uh, with this whole coronavirus. I wish we knew. They're, unfortunately, most people, it's going to be a hard one for Disney because there's no, there's no place on earth that's more crowded than Disney and uh, controlling the attendance in the early days. But uh, to be able to ramp that up, it's going to, I don't know how long it's going to take. And it may not even be possible until there's a vaccine and that people kind of get used to it and get more comfortable with it. And uh, we'll see. I, don't, I think right now you can't predict exactly. I think Disney's going to go in with a plan. And after two weeks, who knows? Half that plan may have to be changed. Uh, like everything if you haven't been through a big crisis you don't know what you'll do until you're in the middle of it and you're evaluating what you did and uh, the best leaders are going to be those who can observe it uh, reflect on it and continue to keep people safe and be willing to change on a dime literally if something's not working we're going to have to change it and the other part is going to be the enforcement of policy you know a lot of americans like to do their thing they don't like to be told what to do so uh, we'll see how that goes. And uh, I'm sure Disney's going to be prepared to be clear with guests when they enter the park. And they're going to be clear with them about enforcing. Um, but those are tough rules, having masks on and children with masks and humidity and heat. And I, we'll see. I don't know. And the good thing about Disney is because there's multiple parks around the world, you know, they're getting to practice right now because China – you know, is starting to reopen and starting to open businesses. And so Shanghai Disney opened about a week ago and they opened at 30% capacity. So they're getting to practice there and see how operations run. And the parks aren't exactly the same, but they are very similar in nature. So they get to see what works there and they're going to use that as a test site to put policies into the other parks all around the world. Although, as Lee said, culture is different. So people are going to also behave differently. And that's where they're going to have to figure out how to make those tweaks in uh, their policies. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, and, and going to the, the other parts around the world, you know, the, the interesting factor in all of that is also the different cultures that are kind of the guests at those parks. 
even <laughs> even here in the U.S., the guests that are in California are a different breed than you know come to to Walt Disney World in Florida. So just because it works at one, it also may not work in the other. So there there is also that tweaking, and I know. You know, there's the guest satisfaction measurements that Disney does, you know, the surveys of the of the guests and things like that. So I think the, the ability and, and it is interesting to see Disney, which is a large ship, if you would, be able to really pivot as quickly as it does as well. I think that's one of the unique factors that it has as a company. Usually, you know, you, you think of large organizations don't really adapt that quickly. But I think Disney has been able to, to do that. Um, another question from our uh, from our students is Grayson Imbriasol. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced that, but um, read Disney creating magic and wondered when you made your first big structural change to Walt Disney World. Well, <clears throat> we started focusing on uh, changing kind of the uh, leadership way we thought about leadership and management and customer service in the I would say nineteen ninety. Four, Judson Green was the president at that time, and he was thinking that we had to do something different to keep ahead of the competition. And after about a year's work, it was decided that better leadership would produce better cast environment, uh, happier cast members, and then they would take care of the guests, and you'd make the bottom line come out the other end. And that was a big change because in the other old days, leadership was kind of two or three people that made all the decision. They weren't interested in your opinion and you do what they said. <laughs> so that was a big change. It took two, three years to kind of get that in place and a lot of training for all new managers. We started rethinking how, what, what skills you needed to be promoted into management uh, and to leadership positions. And uh, so it was a, a definite focus on changing the organizational structure to what leadership really meant, and uh, and it it took time, and uh, it's paying off today. Uh, Hudson Hudson Parker wants to know what was a typical day at Disney like working there. Well, yeah. I can tell you what it's better for me than it was for Daniel. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. <laughs> No, I, I think that's probably one of the things that people that, who work in hospitality love about hospitality and entertainment. There is no typical day. Uh, you, every day you go to work and there, there's routine. You know, every morning you have to open the auto plaza at the Magic Kingdom and the cars come in and you park the cars and you put everyone in the trams and transport them into the parks and you open the main entrance and you open up the attractions. So there is a lot, there's a routine and a procedure that we do. But when you're dealing with so many people from the public, every day something different comes up. You have safety things happening. Uh, you have people who uh, get sick in the park. Maybe they haven't had enough water and they pass out. Um, you have people who have heart attacks because when you have that many people, things happen. You have engagements. People are deciding to get married. Um, every day is uh, I, what I learned working in this business is you create a routine and you create a structure where you want to get things done every day. And then you have to save time out of your schedule to be ready to react to the things that are going to happen that you don't know about yet. So the thing you do know is something's going to happen. You just don't know when, and you don't know what it's going to be, but you got to make sure you plan your day to be able to react to those things. So a lot of my time was spent um, with people, you know, as I, I mentioned earlier, if when you understand your strengths, you can start to understand what kind of environments you want to be in. And I love being with people. I love talking to people. I love interacting with people. And so I, I spent as much time as I could with people, whether it's one on one meeting with them in uh, meetings with larger groups of people or just being out in the park, walking around, talking to guests and talking to cast members so I could understand what was happening in the operation. Um, and, you know, basically my job was to make sure that the cast and the guests every day had uh, a great experience and that they were safe. We were giving them warm hospitality. We were putting on a great show for them and we were being efficient in how we did it and getting them from point A to point B as fast as we could. And if we could deliver those four things, we call them the four keys at Disney. Uh, it was a good day. I can't add to that. It was unpredictable every day. So that kind of ties into the next question we have from Gavin Constantino. He's an eighth grader from Lake Worth Middle School and wants to know what it's like to having to run, you know, such a lot, 
the, having to run your parts of such a large organization? And what do you suggest for people um, moving into those kind of jobs? Well, I didn't know how to do anything, but my key was hiring people around me. And the key in your life is going to be to hire experts if you're going to be in a, a, a high level position or even a moderate position. Uh, at the end of the day, it, uh, it's become way too complex uh, for anybody to know everything. I mean, you can't be the IT expert and the finance expert, and marketing, and sales and uh, supply chain. And the key is if uh, you are the kind of leader that uh, looks for the expertise, you hire the right people, you're clear with them about their authority and uh, what you expect from them and their responsibility. And then you let them do their job and be available for them if they need you. But other than that, that's the key to success is uh, hire great people, train them and treat them right. Let them, let them be uh, responsible for the positions you hired them for. And uh, when you trust people, uh, they will do a good job for you. So I, the only thing I'd add to that from my perspective is um, if you're a student right now and you're in high school and you're going to get out of high school and whether you're going to go continue your education or not, it's getting experience. Um, you know, I, I was mowing lawns when I was 12 years old. I'd mow my neighbor's lawn and our lawn and I started mowing lawns in the neighborhood. So I learned how to, that you had to every Tuesday I had to be out and mow their lawn because the grass got too long. It was harder to mow and they would call me. Why, why didn't you come mow the lawn? So you start learning these things. Um, I worked in high school. I worked in a toy store. I worked in the summers um, as a volunteer in the Rocky mountain national park, learned how to clean latrines and learned how to you know, deal with people. And eventually my first job at Disney was uh, checking in people at a front desk. I'd never done that before. So I learned that I learned how to deal with situations. And then my career at Disney, I had 19 different jobs. So I think a lot of people say, well, you know, how did you suddenly get into an executive job? Nothing happens overnight. Um, you, you, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of enjoying the experience. So first job, park cars, next job, I park cars in France and then I learned to work in ticketing. And so eventually I got promoted and you just keep doing jobs. You keep moving, you keep learning more. And over time you gain experience. And over time that experience builds up, you get more mature, you learn a lot and that prepares you for the next job. So this really is a long distance kind of thing and nothing happens really quickly. You just have to be in the job you're in, do the best you can. And if you do, the next opportunity will, uh, will uh, appear. Hey, Dan, tell them, Daniel, tell them about the uh, time you worked at uh, Copley Marriott and also uh, for a uh, brokerage firm and how you got in there. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I was in college, I worked at the uh, Copley Marriott uh, Champions Bar. I was a, a waiter there. And they hired me because I'd waited tables at the beach after my freshman year in college. So you know, I didn't know it was going to lead to that. And I got to work there on weekends and uh, learned how to multitask. If you've never waited tables, it's a stressful job. And you have to be very organized and have a great memory. And I learned how to do that job. And I loved it. And then the next summer, I worked at Shearson Lehman Investment Firm, an investment bank. And I did not like that at all. I, it was a great experience, but I realized, you know what? I don't want to work in banking. I love hospitality. So even the jobs that you have that you don't like are going to be valuable to you because they're going to help you realize what you don't want to do in your life. And you can cross those off your list. So um, short term, these experiences may be stressful. They may be hard. They may be boring. They may be confusing. They may be fun. But long term, every experience you have is going to benefit you uh, to figure out what you want your path to be. And for Absolutely. me, everybody, everybody should be a waiter. <laughs> That'll give you a lot of experience and a lot of things. Yeah. It, it'll also definitely make you uh, humble and add some humility to your to your repertoire. And I think, you know, one of the things that's been great about Disney, even going back to the beginning, when you when I, I've been watching uh, an Imagineering story on Disney Plus and seeing how so many people work their way from within the company to upper management because they brought the different skill sets uh, that we talked about. Now, a couple more fun questions that we've uh, seen pop up in the chat. Scarlett Jimenez wants to know, uh, what are some of the Easter eggs at the Disney parks that you know of? I don't wow. know, Dad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's uh, obviously the the hidden Mickeys. That is a big thing that Walt Disney Imagineering loves to do is hide 
some of those Mickeys and they're all over the place. Um, some of the other ones I know about, you know, often when Disney uh, gets rid of an attraction and puts a new attraction in place, they like to have a little nod to the old attraction. So for example, uh, there's an attraction called 20,000 leagues under the sea in Fantasyland at, uh, or is it kind of in Tomorrowland at the magic kingdom? Well, now that's where the, um, mine train, the seven doors mine train is. And so if you look in the concrete, you'll see a little uh, submarine that used to be in that attraction. And that's kind of a little nod to them. So there's, if you go online and Google that, you'll find all kinds of ones. I discovered them every single day um, or I'd read about them or people would tell me about them. Um, I'm a big fan of the Pixar film Easter eggs because they always connect with each other. And there's always something in a Pixar film that has, you know, in, in Finding Nemo, there's references to Toy Story and all these subtle things. But yeah, there's a lot of little details that Imagineering puts in place. Um, one quick story I'll tell you, because I thought this was really neat. If you go to um, uh, Liberty Square at the Magic Kingdom, uh, you know, it's colonial, right? It's it's mm -hmm. the late 1700s. If you look at the shutters on all the buildings, they're slightly tilted. They're not straight. They lean off to the side a little bit. And when I talked to Imagineering, you know, they explained, they said, well, we did that on purpose. They're not straight on purpose. And I said, I couldn't imagine why they wouldn't be straight because they knew what straight was back in 1700. And he said, well, actually, during the Revolutionary War, they would take the hinges off buildings and use them to make bullets out of so they could go into battle against the British. And so they had to get leather straps to put up the, the, uh, the shutters on all the buildings, other stretches. And so over time, none of them were straight. And Imagineering decided to recreate it. They wanted to be a little off. And you wouldn't know that. You'd think they just we didn't do a good job until you hear that story. Then you realize it was done on purpose. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's some of the attention to detail that I love. I know one of my uh, favorite Easter eggs that I point out when I go with friends is at uh, Dinosaur in Animal Kingdom, which used to be counted onto extinction. But if you look at the pipes that are running overhead in the queue while you're waiting, um, they'll say CTX uh, DI, which is kind of the extinction, Disney Imagineering, and then there's this formula. Well, if you notice, the pipes are yellow, red, and white. And the formula is the chemical composition for ketchup, mustard, and mayonnaise because the ride was originally sponsored by McDonald's. Ah, there you go. And there are thousands of those stories. I don't think everyone knows all of them. Yeah, no, yeah, I think even the Imagineers, they know the ones that they uh, help put in and maybe some of the ones for the rides that they either replaced or were their favorites. But yeah, there's just way too many for everybody to know. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that's also been asked is, what are, what's your best memory of while working at Disney? Wow. Or wow. is that like picking a favorite child? <laughs> I think my best memories were certainly the days I was able to go out in the park and just... Uh, observe the guests really having a great time and the excitement of the children. I mean, it was a lot more fun and exciting and uh, than sitting in my office trying to deal with financial issues. And so I would say being out, out and about and uh, seeing wh what a great, seeing the, seeing the show in progress everywhere where people are doing their jobs, their roles and the guests are just loving it. So uh, that was for me, uh, uh, relaxing to get out of the office and go out and actually I often took my grandkids with me so I could be in disguise and see how things look because when you got a child in each hand, uh, nobody realizes it's you. So it's a good way. And we had fun because the kids taught me a lot of things that weren't so good. They told me the water in the water fountain was warm and the children's meals weren't good. <laughs> so I got a lot of uh, things to work on when I got back to the office. They'll always keep it honest. <laughs> yeah, Lee was the original undercover boss before that TV show ever came out. <laughs> Just show up and experience your operation firsthand, and you learn a lot about it. I, I agree yeah, with Lee. I think my you know, best experience. Coca-Cola, you'll find out how hard it is sometimes. That's right. Yeah, my best memories, I mean, 26 years there, It's uh, there's so many things I remember back. But I think, as Lee said, just daily being able to go out and and not take for granted all these people who had come from all over the world to to be part of this show that we were able to be involved with every day it was nothing i never took that for granted every day i knew we were doing something special there and um 
you know, watching the, the employees, watching our employees interact with our guests. And just, we knew, and it's, it's your, you, you know, a lot of the employees forget you are creating a memory right now that this little kid's going to remember the rest of their lives. And you may not even know it. And that's, uh, I think that's what something's pretty special about uh, Disney. Uh, yeah. Zoe Wolf wants to know, it's a little bit more of a light question, but what, what is your favorite Disney movie or song? Well, mine was actually, believe it or not, I did. I wasn't. I, I don't. By the time I got to Disney, I had. I was a lot older, and I hadn't thought much about Disney movies. But uh, when I saw The Lion King, I was uh, blown away, and it still is quite emotional. It's quite moving. There's a good lesson in there, and uh, I thought it was really well told. And I love the music and 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 the lessons it taught about leadership and and. Uh, the difficult things that happen in life. So it was great. I love it. I guess today I probably would like frozen like everybody else. <laughs> and I got, I have two movies. Um, you know, I grew up, I was a teenager in the 1980s when arcades existed and you'd get your quarters and go in and play the games. And so Tron for me was always just such a cool movie. Uh, the Absolutely. original Tron. And then um, the other one that uh, came out a few years ago, um, it's the only movie I wouldn't say I cried. I don't cry at movies, but I definitely teared up uh, was Coco. And uh, I don't know why, but it just seemed like maybe because I'm getting older and you watch the the power family. And I've always really believed that, you know, when someone, a family member passes away, they never leave. And And even before the movie, if you tell stories about them, they will always be alive. And, you know, our, my grandparents, and my, my wife's parent, grandparents talking about them keeps them alive. And I really, that connected with me, that story in Coco. Great. Yeah, I have the same thing with, uh, with Up, the whole beginning with Carl and Ellie at the very beginning. It, it yeah. just gets me, gets me choked up. Um, yeah. But I think it's that whole, that whole family connection. And I think of my, my grandparents and my parents and things like that. Um, next question that we have is, what skills do you think uh, people need to manage large groups of people. Appreciation for people, of all people, respect on every level. Just uh, to me, that it's everything. If you don't have an appreciation for people uh, and understand that all people are the same, you might have a few advantages personally, but your job is to make their life better. And uh, I think about that all the time. Am I being enough for people in this world? I didn't always think that. In my early career, I thought it was all about me. But then I slowly but surely over the time saw I can become a teacher and and share your knowledge with people and experiences. That's that's what does. I like it when people write me a note and say, thank you for what you did for me five years ago, 10 years ago, or what you taught me. That's the big turn on. Yeah, and I think similarly, we, um, we, we talk about, you know, the term, a slippery slope, you know, Walt Disney world gets 50 million guests every year that visits there. And if, in, in, you know, if you look at any business, if you look at the supermarket up the street, there's a lot of people going through every day through there every day. And as a manager, as a leader, you can never say, well, that was just one person. You, and to Lee's point, you have to have an appreciation for people and keep the mindset, no matter how many people you're managing or how many people you're, how many customers you have, everybody's individual and you have to treat them that way. And it's, it's challenging because when you're dealing with large volumes, you have to figure out how to move large volumes of people around and, and get them from point A to point B and make sure they have a great experience. But then you have to focus on everyone individually if they want, if they need something from you. And it's, uh, it's challenging and you need a lot of patience and you need a lot of humility to be able to, uh, to pull that off and yeah, Disney definitely is a, a master of moving people uh, in large amounts of people I know uh, I've been on a few Disney cruises and we were on the dream on one of its uh, inaugural year and it was a full ship but it never felt like we were in a large crowd of people but that's because Disney has become an expert at at moving the people without making it feel like it's a large herd and I would add back to what skills you need. I tell people often, I finally learned in my career, you need both empathy and discipline. You know, you got to have empathy to deal with people as individuals, as Daniel just said, and, and to 
think about are you reaching them and do they understand and understand that everybody's got a problem you don't know about and they're from different backgrounds and walks of life and religions and all those areas and uh, you got to have that empathy and then you got to have the discipline to do the hard things i always said it's like being a mother you know you got to have empathy and discipline so your kids grow up because if you just have empathy everybody's going to love you and think you're nice but you're not going to get much done and if you don't have discipline your kids are going to grow up and be a mess and so are your employees so empathy and discipline are two really that's why we talk so much about being organized doing the hard things having the hard discussions uh, just like your mother did when you were growing up and uh, you got to do that as a leader because you want people to be successful period yeah another word for that is called tough love <laughs> <laughs> and yeah and that's that's a lot, you know, it's being a, being a teacher, being a parent, being a boss. I think a lot of it requires all the, the same skills that you're, that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Um, talking about skills a little bit. So in today's learning environment where it, especially now where it's being done virtually and there's no bells to mark the change of classes or, or teachers changing subjects necessarily. Um, how do you suggest, you know, students are able to, manage their time, have that time management that I know you're such a big proponent of to make sure that they're making the most out of their day. Well, I know Daniel's kids in the seventh grade, they were given a planner and they started teaching them how to plan and write things down and follow up and, uh, you know, all, all learning. The earlier you start with learning, the better it is for parents at home, you know, that checklist on the, uh, on the uh, refrigerator. Uh, every kid's got a phone now. They can set an alarm to remind them to do whatever they're supposed to do at a certain time. Uh, I mean, my alarm is set five or six times today for different things I have. It's usually set 10 minutes before I have to do it, and then it goes off again when I have to do it. So we just got to teach kids how to use the resources and things they have available today. And pen and pencil works too, and a watch or a phone. Those are big tools that can make you uh, reliable and credible and do what's supposed to do. Yeah, I'd say that I agree. Um, a lot of people think, well, if you want to do really well, just work hard and be able to think on your feet, but you can never underestimate how much being organized and creating structure is. And uh, once you create structure and you have an organization, then you can be creative, then you can improvise, then you can play off of that. But if you have 100% um, improvisation and you're not planning ahead, you're always going to be in behind the curve. You're always going to be playing catch up. And so the sooner you can learn that. And I, it took me a long time to learn that. I was a procrastinator. If I didn't want to do something, I would just put it off and wait till the night before or the morning of. And after a while, I just the stress of not being ready for things got to me. And I finally started to have more discipline. And the sooner you can figure that out, the better. There is no secret formula. It's just deciding that you want to be really good at what you do. Um, and it has nothing to do with how smart you are. Everyone can be organized and everyone can work hard. You just have to you know, decide that you want to be that way. And not because your parents want you to, and not because you want to make a lot of money and not because you want to go to college, because you have a personal pride in what you do. And if you can do that, you'll have a lot more options uh, later when you get older. And it's true. Reliability and credibility and setting an example and keeping your promises is a big deal for your reputation and how people trust you. So there's a lot of uh, payback for being having your act together. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm you know very similar where I have multiple times I have. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> I have. Um, I have alarm set that warned me the day before and then an hour before 10 minutes and then uh, at the event because I don't want to forget something. And I'm the kind of person that would rather, you know, that early is on time and on time is late. And I think that a lot of that gets, gets lost in today's generation, um, especially with the, um, the instant gratification, if you would, with being able to pull up anything that they want right at their fingertips. They don't need to, I mean, we grew up in the generation of having to go to a library and hope that the book that you wanted was there, whether it was for school or to read, where now you could, you know, download pretty much anything or, or look it up online when you're doing your research. So I think that so much of the time management is lost because of the instant gratification. Um, by the way, they're not teaching it in school. 
That's the problem. They're not teaching it in high school. They're not teaching it in middle school. And they're not teaching it in college. And when you think about it, it may be the most important thing you need to know is not how smart you are. Can you get anything done? You know? I mean, yeah, literally. I, and, I know and it, relieves, it relieves anxiety and stress when you've got a system that know that you're not always having to try to remember everything because you can't, first of all. Yeah. yeah, I know a lot of our elementary and middle schools, actually, every student is, is given a planner to, to help them keep track of their assignments and daily work and, and things like that. A, a little bit more is lost at the high school. Some of the high schools have planners, some don't. And I think that there, there is a level of, you know, still needing to teach kids responsibility. But at the high school level, you kind of need to force them less and let them take on a little bit more of the, the challenge themselves and, and learn to fail when, when they don't. Um, quick question from uh, Hibatola. Um, I cannot pronounce the last name. I apologize. But did you ever have any new ideas on what you could add to Disney to make it a more magical place that you just couldn't add for whatever the reason was? I didn't. Daniel may have. I didn't get very involved in the shows and the attractions. That was the Imagineering group. Uh, yeah, I mean, we added things. Uh, I, we, you get resistance sometimes when you have a good idea, but overall, uh, I would say if you keep pushing, you eventually get what you want. And if you don't, I mean, but I can't think of anything specific that would have changed Disney very much that I couldn't get through. But there's always a bureaucracy, you know. Everybody's got 10 ideas. And uh, yeah, overall, I think part of it is the, um, the, the approach we always take. I don't have a specific example, but there are times when an idea would come up and someone would say, what if the guest could do this? And we'd say, okay, let's now calculate how many guests can do that every hour and how many guests can do that every day. Because when you, it, sometimes it seems like a good idea, but when you have, you know, 40,000 people visiting your park and you can only do a hundred people every hour, you know, that's going to be a thousand people out of 40,000 people. So you're always balancing it. As you know, Eric, between how good is the experience and how personal is it and how many people are going to get to see it. Because if you create something that not many people can see, you can create a lot of dissatisfaction. And so you're always balancing that, the practical side of uh, how efficient is it going to be and the creative side of how great is it going to be. And you find the, the happy medium. Yeah, I mean, that reminds me of the story that I told you, you know, before we came on where at the, at the pre-opening of Animal Kingdom, um, there actually used to be a boat ride that went around that river in Animal Kingdom, and Michael Eisner, who was the head of Disney at the time, rode the ride, and I happened to be there when he was getting off, and he's like, you want people to wait how long for this? And it was a <laughs> wonderful ride, but when you actually, if you thought about if the park was at capacity, the, the lines that there would be for that ride, it, it, it would not have been worth it at that point, and then you have that dissatisfaction. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll give a quick story of something I learned when I was there, when I worked at Hollywood Studios we were starting to get a lot of requests from guests that they needed someplace to charge their device, their iPhone or their Android or whatever phone they had. They'd run out of batteries. So we came up with an idea. We were going to build a locker bank where you could um, open the locker, plug your phone in, close the locker, and then come back and get it later once it was charged. And we thought that was the idea. And we went down the path with that idea. And when we presented it, we got a few questions. One was, are people really going to want to leave their phone in the locker rather than in their pocket? Because you need to have it to be able to communicate. And B, how many lockers do you need? And I said, we're, we're getting 50 lockers. They said, all right, on an average day, how many people need to charge their phones? And once they said that, we realized this is a bad idea. And if you go to Walt Disney World now, we have vending machines where you can buy a battery and it's recyclable and you put it in your phone, you can carry it around and you can get new batteries. So sometimes if you think through these in a very practical way, you come to much better solutions. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, there, there has to be that thought process of, as you said, you know, what is the good idea and then what is the practical solution sometimes right. um, with that. So with that, I think we're going to wrap up. But do you guys have any last bits of wisdom that you want to share with our audience before we before we take off? I do. I want to tell students out there that uh, don't underestimate what you can achieve in your life. I don't care if you're a good student, an average student. Keep learning. 
you got the internet now. Try to figure out something you love and focus on that. See, I dropped out of college. I didn't graduate, but one day I woke up and decided it was a good idea to start learning. So I started reading, watching tapes, going to seminars, and I caught up. But uh, sometimes I wasn't a very good student in school. I told somebody I wrote four books, but I still don't know where the commas go. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and I so I hired somebody to put all the commas in the right place in my books. And I'm still trying to figure out what those semicolons are about. I've never went <laughs> used one of those in my life. Mm -hmm. But I got better and better at what I did. And then I hired people around me to take care of those. So don't worry about if you're not great in algebra or physics or uh, you'll find your way. And uh, there's so many ways to learn today. And I one is keep reading, read about it. And Daniel gave you the best one. Get experience, go out and get jobs, work, get to know people, work with adults. Uh, and you'll find out uh, because when you go to work and after you get out of college or school, your mother won't be there. So you got to be on time. You got to get along with people. And the prior experience will really pay off for you a lot and be impressive when somebody looks at your resume and sees you worked. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think the other the other piece here um, I think is important that I've seen in my life and uh, you know, with our kids and, and people I've seen at Disney um, two things. One is uh, experience is not only going to give you, you know, the opportunity to see new things, but keep looking for role models. They're all over the place. Uh, you might meet someone at the grocery store or you may work for somebody, or you may have a teacher or you may have a, someone in your school who's two grades ahead of you. Look for people who you're, you are impressed with and you want to be like, and take whatever they do well and try to implement that yourself. Um, as Lee said, when you start your career, when you start working, you don't know much. Everyone starts at the same place. They don't know anything. And over time, you get experiences, you see people, you see, you see role models, and you try to be like them. And when I look at my leadership style now or the way I want to live my life, it's, it's, uh, it's a little piece of all the people I've met in my life that, and the things that I really was impressed with them that I pulled uh, out and tried to live myself. The other thing I'd tell you is, um, I like this phrase, run your own race. Um, only you can define what your success is going to be. Don't let anyone tell you how much money you have to make. Don't let anyone tell you how big your house has to be. Don't let anyone tell you what job you should have. Everyone decides what um, is going to be their goals in their life. And over time, you are the only one that can live your own life. So talk to people you trust listen to their advice, but then the day know that only you are the one who's going to live your own life and make the decision based on what you want to do, not what you see on Instagram, not what you see on Facebook, not what your friends or your family thinks you need to do. Uh, listen to them, but at the end of the day, make sure you're focusing on doing things to be happy. And a lot of times in order to be happy, you're going to have to work a lot and you're going to have to be disciplined. You're going to have to do a lot of things really well, but uh, that's going to bring a lot. That I think you'll um, you'll be much more uh, content with your life if you think about things that way. Awesome. Thanks so much for the great advice, guys. I think that's great uh, great for our students. Um, one thing I want to add, too, is um, I was uh, binge watching Disney Plus, Plus this weekend as well. Um, you heard the, the people in the chat have heard some of the jobs that Dan and Lee did while at Disney, but it's just amazing to see how many jobs Disney really has by the different types of jobs they have that you yeah. wouldn't even think of. So um, I saw some people talking about Disney Plus at the beginning of the stream in the chat. So if you have Disney Plus, definitely check out the One Day at Disney. Um, it go, they're just short little six to eight minute clips of, of different jobs at Disney that you would never believe exist, like a, like a snorkeler who has to go in and actually fix like the jungle cruise or, or the, or the, the sub ride, uh, 20,000 leagues under the sea. Like no one would have thought you would need a, a scuba diver, uh, to fix rides. Like that's a kind of a, a weird job to think about. Um, there's animal keepers. If you like animals, there's so many different job types at Disney. So, you know, obviously you can think of the ones that are right in front of you, like rides and hospitality and all that stuff. But, there are so many people behind the scenes too. So, you know, there's definitely a career at Disney for just about everyone. Um, that's what's so cool about the, about the franchise, I think. Well, I think Walt even recognized, you know, the importance of every person that worked at Disney, even down to the custodians. 
um, you know, it, he was he was famous for going through the park, and if he saw a piece of paper, even though he ran the company, he would pick it up himself and and throw it away. Just nobody's nobody's job is less important than somebody else's. Whether you're serving food to cast members behind the scenes or whether you're you know, on stage, uh, running one of the shows, uh, they're all just as important as the other ones. Yes, for sure. So thank you guys for that. We appreciate the time. We are going to end with just a few quick uh, announcements for those of uh, those who are watching. Um, first of all, students, we want you to share your thoughts. So if you're part of Palm Beach, we actually have an assignment for you. It's not a hard assignment. But what we want you to do is go to the URL. There's either a, um, a QR code to scan with your phone or you can type in uh, bit.ly slash 001. And um, I'm just trying to get it in the chat here. I forgot to copy it. B -L -E. um, it is case sensitive uh, with the capital V, capital L, capital E, and those are zeros. But it'll allow you to take a quick Flipgrid selfie video. They are moderated, but we want you to tell us what you thought. If you have any other questions for Lee or Dan, uh, we're going to give them a quick remix and let them uh, just let you see what your thoughts are about uh, their chat here. So please feel free to fill out that Flipgrid, just a uh, quick 30 seconds, what you thought, uh, any other questions, and just a, also a thank you for their time with us as well. We appreciate that. For our teachers on the experience, we do have our schedule on the website, which is bit.ly slash PBC virtual experiences. Note the capital letters there. But there are some extra supplemental resources for your students. There is the link to that Flipgrid, but like for this stream, for example, we have a Newzella article on Walt Disney, one on theme parks and scientific research, and dream jobs as being an animator. So those supplemental resources could go along with this video, um, just so you can learn a little bit more as some extension activities. And each day we're going to tell you what's coming tomorrow. So tomorrow I'm excited to announce that we're going to have DJ Herbert Holler who is a DJ in New York City who DJs for huge groups of people uh, normally when we're uh, in normal conditions. But he's going to talk about what it's like to be a DJ, what it takes to be a DJ, and the journey that he went through uh, to get where he is today. There's also going to be some stuff about social media and how to behave online as well and what to do when people attack you online. So uh, don't miss that one tomorrow at 1130. And so with that, I do want to thank again our guests, Dan and Lee. You guys were awesome for our first uh, virtual event. We do appreciate you a lot. Um, and so otherwise, thank you all for joining us. Have a great day, everyone.